Welcome to Bridal Cry Ministries. I'm very heavy hearted today. Because what Matt and I have to say today and from this point on Most of the church is not ready to hear. Just not ready to hear. Not ready to accept. Not able to accept. And a big reason for that is because The leaders of the church have trained us, the congregation, in the doctrines of men and not trained us in the way of the Spirit. They've trained us to hear and discern their voice rather than hearing and discerning the voice of God. And now, in the place that we are in this world, in this time, in this age, the Spirit is saying something through the prophets. He's saying something to the saints. And many are unable to accept it because it clashes with the doctrines of men that they've been conditioned by. Breaks my heart. Because the Lord is returning. Do you hear that? He's returning. It's already begun. And Matt and I have been commissioned to help prepare the way for that return, for his return in the hearts of men. In the hearts of men, so many of them can't accept it because of doctrines of demons and systematic thoughts and ideas that have been implanted in us for generations. And so we're going to be talking about leadership today. And we're going to do our best to help us overcome the barriers that are preventing you as you listen to this to even accept what I just said about Christ's return and your need for readiness and what it's going to take for you to stand before him unashamed and to endure the tribulation that's coming and to not grow faint. Our ministry has never been seeker-friendly and easy listen, um, but it's about to get a lot heavier. And we love you, and we want to help you. We're not after ratings, we're not after clicks, we're not after views, we're after readiness in the body of Christ for all those who are waking up and coming into the calling that we were all called to and to help stand with Christ in this age where deception and evil and death is going to have its day. That we will be those virgins, those wise virgins that go and purchase oil for the journey ahead. God is giving us a grace to speak and release this now so that those who have ears to hear will hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. How's that for an introduction? I'm your host, Daniel Master Leonardo, <laughs> with my co-host, Matthew Enns, here to talk about spiritual leadership in the church and what we can do to be ready for this calling. Matt, I'm going to let you talk for a minute. Kick us off, my friend. Yeah, I just had a couple passages in my, in my noggin as you were getting this going, and, uh, you know what? You can't fake 
for yourself, I'm not saying for others, you can't fake for yourself, is the fear of the Lord. Yeah. You just can't. Like you can you could maybe work yourself up into like a soul frenzy or get excited or happy or convinced or angry, but you cannot fake that deep spiritual awareness of the magnitude of the being that you have dealings with the Lord himself. And you're not going to be able to have holiness in the house of God. You're not able to have holiness as a leader. You're not able to have holiness as a saint, a priest, without the fear of the Lord. And you're not able to withstand trials that cause fear unless you have had an encounter with the greatest fear in the universe, the terror of the Lord. So the one that God will look to, Isaiah 66, 2, is the one who is humble and contrite and who trembles at my word. And Malachi, the other passage in my mind, uh, wraps up 14, chapter 1, For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. I don't think it's safe when we take words like this and reduce their value. Thus, one of the signs of the Lord's movement and working is the fear of the Lord. So then, chapter 3, verse 5 of Malachi talks about he'll draw near to his saints, the Israelites, for judgment, to be a swift witness against sorcerers. That means people who are deep in soul. Adulterers, that's a sex culture. Guess what we have? Hmm. Uh, those who swear falsely, that means they don't walk in total light and truth. Guess what we have? Oppressing the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, those who thrust aside the alien. And lastly, I will draw near for judgment against those who do not fear me, says Yahweh of hosts. Y you can't fake the fear of the Lord, but if you're seeking him and he's readying you, if he's wineskin changing you, and, and even as a spiritual leader in house in the house, encountering the fear of the Lord should be part of the formula of your experience. There should be solemnity and sobriety. That doesn't mean that there can't be joy along the way. That doesn't mean there can't be joy there after. And, and I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. fill with joy. What I'm saying is, without any sense of the fear of the Lord, you have not come into the holy of holies. <laughs> you have not come into yeah. the inner court. You have not trespassed out of the outer court and into the inner court. That without some sense of the Grand Canyon epic proportions of what you're dealing with in the Lord, there is no progress. So Dan, I guess when we could build all kinds of proofs about why we think now's the time and why to get serious, and we'll do some of that. But it's the reassuring presence of the fear of the Lord that gives me hope and confidence in what we're saying. Because it's not flippant. It's not flippant. There is joy, but it's not a flippant thing. We can't be jocular. We can't be casual. And so that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. Yeah. I just got a message from a friend on my phone just now who's sitting in church and had an epiphany, a revelation that he shared. And it seems timely as we're here recording this message. So I am going to just read this really quick. The virgins needed to take lamps because it was dark. If it were day, there would be no need for light. And the darkness lasted longer than expected. The bridegroom was delayed. I want to talk about delay. Which is why they needed flasks of oil as a reserve. Before you say, well, duh, <laughs> let me point out that this is counter to the message the American church is preaching. The world has got to get dark, really dark, before the bridegroom returns. The only light that will be seen in the world is the lamps of the virgins, the light of Christ in his bride. 
The darkness will last longer than expected. The tribulation will drag on. Even so much that half of those waiting will flame out. Woe to them. They were made ready, virgins, but they did not endure. The popular American church teaches either that Christ is restoring all things now, or that Christ will return before the darkness covers the earth. Both are misleading and dangerous messages to the church. Unfortunately, good intentions are not equal to actually getting to the actual end. Because gold, silver, and precious metals are tested by fire versus wood, hay, and stubble. And God promised a fire. He promised a fire for the end. He promised it. He promised at the end of Matthew 7, there will be a storm in what you build your house on. It will be tested. It will be tested. And and I'm not saying a hireling is someone who's a, a cult leader. I'm not saying a hireling is someone who hasn't been genuinely leading people to Christ and salvation. I'm not saying a hireling is someone who intended to be a hireling or intended to be false. But, Dan, there's only one way this thing finishes, and it's the same way that it started. Yeah, We're not going to finish using different principles, different leadership mechanisms, different ideas than the ones that started this. We're in the same age as when this thing started. And hirelings are those who in any way are coming up with different principles and different rules to finish this thing than the ones that started it. So what we have is we have a body of leaders, body of saints, who really are eating the tree of life genuinely. They do love the Lord. You can sense that. But the system and the religion that we're operating with here called Christianity teaches them to feed and think using the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so that creates this mixture and there creates a confusion. Because here's Dan and Matt coming and saying that which we have seen and that which we have heard and the only thing that we want to talk about is the tree of life dynamic and point people toward preparedness and the vessels that are helping prepare. And it creates confusion because it says, well, but Matt, well, but Dan, I like my leader because they're a good person. I like my leader because I can see Christ in them. I like my leader because I can tell that they have a vibrant relationship with the Lord as well. They probably do. What we're saying is, Where's their stopping point? Because they cannot take one soul past the point that they're willing to stop. Their wagon train will go to a certain point. And if that wagon train will not proceed past that, all the way into bridal completion fullness, using the mechanisms we've been discussing here, toward the goal that we've been discussing here, any point of stopping before the actual arrival spot yeah. can't have that can't we can't I'm going to be breaking down um, based on the direction Matt's taking us and the spirit's taking us right now we're going to spend some time in John chapter 10 you got your Bibles, open it up. We'll flash some on the screen, I'm sure. Or you could just listen. Starting in verse 1, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. There are ways to enter into leadership in church. 
Seminary is the biggest one. Experience is the second. Knowing somebody is a third. Being deeply charismatic and a good speaker is another. Being very wealthy (laughs) and influential is another. Having business management experience, organizational management experience is another. Being a Martha and super busy and always hosting and having a big home where you can facilitate things is another. These are not bad. God can use and does use all of these things. And God does not work against himself. So regardless of where someone's heart is, he'll use evil men and good men alike to accomplish his purposes. But he who does not climb, go through the door, is a thief and a robber. So what does that mean? What is the door? Jesus Christ is that door. And how do we come into Jesus Christ but the loss of our own life? It is when we are confronted with the cross and the fear of the Lord that we go in through the one narrow way of Jesus Christ. Seminary is a way of qualifying men in knowledge and in doctrines of men and in precepts of men with pre conditioned conclusions as to what the scriptures teaches versus the spirit teaching you what is he doing in revealing the son versus the door, which is Christ himself. That's good. So what's the difference, Daniel? Okay. So you got someone trained in the scriptures. You got someone that's super influential that can do all of these things versus someone that walks in the way of the door. What's the difference? Let's talk about that. Cause Jesus talks about that. To him, the one who goes through the door, which is Christ, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And of course, we're talking about Christ as well. When he brings all his own out, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not never follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were, which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and life abundantly. And here's the key. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, the hireling, is not concerned about the sheep. And he's not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches and scatters them. But I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. Dan, are you saying that there's a wolf coming? (laughs) The sad thing is, is that if you guys have ever seen a bell curve of the typical adoption to new ideas, there's like 15% at the very beginning that accept it early and see the warning signs and see the changing of the skies and the temperatures and make the jump. And then when things after you've already had the initial onslaught, you have a 60% buy on right in the middle. And then you have your late adopters at the very end tail end when it's too late. Sadly, 15 ish percent of everyone hearing this message may say, Holy crap, is my pastor a shepherd listening to the voice of the great shepherd and going to find the green pastures and the living waters by the voice of the shepherd because he is a sheep himself? And is he allowing that great shepherd to shepherd him so that the sheep can be cared for and protected? And will he lay his life down for those sheep? And to does he have a fear of the Lord? And is he defending doctrines or is he defending Christ and his way and listening discerning and awake, discerning the times being led by the spirit in humility and truth and and reverence of the word of God, which I'm reading from right now. Is everything rooted in that? Or is my shepherd and my leader a hireling? Where as soon as the wolf comes is going to scatter and lead us to be devoured. 
And if it is a hireling, are they even knowing how to bring me to green pastures? And are they knowing themselves when the wolf is coming? The sad part is it's not, it's not going to be until the shepherd flees, the hireling flees, and the wolf comes that a majority of people are going to go, oh, oops. All right, Matt. Can I bounce off of that for you, Dan? Please. Okay. I got two phrases for you. God promises that everything will be all right. Here's your other phrase. Jesus Christ, the overcomer, must be eaten. Which one should you face the future with? Because if the message is everything is going to be all right, God promises it. What am I not being told to do? Eat Christ, the overcomer, and be transformed radically within my inner nature so that he, the overcomer, can become full in me. Which one's actually going to get you ready for the wolf? Which one's actually going to get you ready for the long, dark night? Which one? Because what we have is a whole lot of folks entering services and leaving services, very proud that they have the word of God and its promises, and not being exercised in their soul as to whether or not the measure of Christ in them is sufficient to overcome the darknesses. Because the only thing God's going to glorify for all eternity is Ephesians 4, the measure of Christ in the vessel. The thing that God wants to glorify for all eternity is the Son in a people. And to take that and lower it down to say, we have this promise. You can disengage mentally, emotionally, and spiritually because God promises everything's going to be okay. Has God promised everything will be okay? For those who are in Christ. <laughs> like, Dan, what's going on, man? What age are we in? How come the preaching of Christ has become reduced to since you said a prayer so long ago, everything's going to be great or fine or you'll overcome it because of just promise versus everything the scriptures speak, such as the end of Colossians 1, Paul striving so that they would become complete in Christ. (laughs) Hebrews, how many times in Hebrews does it urge and cajole the saint? How come Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 that he buffets his body and makes it a slave so that after preaching to others, he himself may not be disqualified? How come there is no fear of the Lord over the nature of my nature still dominating me that Galatians is teaching actually in Christ, the crucified life? There's your ability to overcome sin and Satan and the world. We have a division, Dan, and one is the message of the higher and one is the message that will produce the end. In a people, forget about time for a second. Only one can produce God's end in a people. You know, there's part of me that doesn't blame the leaders of our church because they're a product of the leaders over them and the voices over them. We're all a product of this. And, you know, I I grew up in a, Matt and I both grew up in a very cessationist background, which toted and touted and is still to this day recognizes the authoritative voice in biblical accuracy, precision, and hermeneutical standard. They are the line. That's our background. We have it right. And they have a lot of stuff right, guys. They got the historical context locked in. But they have all but denounced the present ministry and guidance of the Holy Spirit apart from the Word of God. When you enter into the holy place in the temple, you have the lampstand, which I would argue is the Word of God. But there's also... The lampstand lit. (laughs) What good is a candle if there's no fire burning at the end of that? That's good. 
the word of God's great unless it is unilluminated by the spirit of God. Once you have the word and the spirit as one, then and only then do you have light in that temple, in that tabernacle, in order to see the feast of Christ before you, to fellowship and to eat his body and to drink his blood. And only then are you able to go to that golden altar and intercede for the will of the Lord and the purpose of the Lord. If you don't have, you can't have the spirit without the word. It's nothing to light. And you can't see if you only have the word and not the spirit. So I don't blame them. But if you have pastors and teachers and leaders over you, one, if they're not spirit led, they're not going to be saying anything like what we're saying right now. But if they have a word that's different from Jesus and the apostles, you have issues with that. Let me just quickly, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's Christ. Uh, Paul, Acts 14, 22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Hmm. Romans 5, 3 through 5, talks about suffering, producing perseverance, character, and hope. 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live in godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And of course, we know 1 Peter 4.12-13, um, do not be surprised by the fiery trials, but rejoice. James, rejoice in sufferings that you fall into. Do not be surprised. And I think that's the concern that I have is too many are going to be surprised because there's too many doctrines that are teaching something other than readiness. And so how do we distinguish the hirelings from the true shepherds? It has to do with, have you been trained to hear the voice of God? When I bring that up to people, I get blank stinking stares because my pastor doesn't teach me how to hear the voice of God. And I'm poking at the charismatic community here too, friends. It's it's easy to poke at the cessationist conservatives that don't have any type of concept around the active living rhema voice of God in your heart or in your ears. I don't care. But the charismatics as well, I'm sorry, but you're being trained in emotionalism. There are some, and I, I love my prophetic community. I love my spirit-filled brethren that I believe do hear from the voice of God. So children, my friends, we're not dismantling everything. You guys, if this applies to you, great. If it doesn't, great. <laughs> Praise God that you're like, yes, I affirm and agree and can cry out amen. And if you're offended by this message and you're thinking this is too bombastic, Hey, John 10, the uh, scripture that I was just reading, guess what it says towards the end? Uh, verse 19, oh, a division occurred among the Jews because of these words. And many were saying he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Uh, so if that's you, <laughs> I just want to caution you to take heed. Take heed. Wrestle. Bring this not to your doctrines. Bring this to Christ. And if you say, I don't know how to do that, then that's your fault, not mine. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? If you have a theology of doubt and skepticism that you can even live by the daily voice of God, then you've neglected the scriptures, not me. Do you hear that? We do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God that proceeds from the Father. Linguistic lesson. Is that logos or rhema? What word are we living off of every day? Go look it up in the Greek. You'll find that it says rhema. The spoken, current active word of God is what we are to live off every day. I already covered the fact. Is that neglecting the word? No, you can't have the spirit without the, you can't have the rhema without the logos, nothing to light. We are not neglecting the word. In fact, we are taking the word in its most literal form. 
I'm not explaining it away through historical jujitsu here. Taking the word and says, it says that, and it has not changed. 8070D accomplished some things. It did not accomplish everything, my friends. And you charismatics that are thinking that just because you had an emotional experience and you're riding one conference to the next, what's holiness look like in your life? What's fear of the Lord look like in your life? What dark night of the soul have you gone through to silence all of those charismatic utterances and experiences? Have you come to the end of that journey? And the people that you follow, have they even had that journey? Let not many of you become teachers. Or you're going to incur a stricter judgment. You're going to be held to the standard a little bit more strictly. And also, don't elevate anybody that has not been tested, that are too young. Why? Because they're going to become arrogant. And I'm telling you, followers, who are trying to find those who listen, dig into that person's life and figure out what cross and what testing they've endured and how have they come to the other end of that. What are the lessons they've learned? Is it pride and self-reliance and knowledge? Is it deep humility and brokenness? Or have they even experienced hardship? Don't trust anybody that hasn't experienced hardship and feels qualified to lead you. You don't know what's within them if they have not been tested and squeezed to see what comes out. We know what was in Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was squeezed. Not my will, but your will be done came out. Yeah, bit of a heavy day. <laughs> <laughs> Did a bit of a heavy day, Dan. Dan and I, Dan and I both in the last uh, eight days encountered not just the fear of the Lord. A fellow from my household encountered the massive fear of the Lord. We both encountered the release of unexpected fruitfulness in preaching Christ. There's been a severe shift last weekend. It was tied to some other things that also had the voice of the Lord attached to them as to the time that we're in and the time that is left and the time that remains. And it has prompted both Dan and I to say, yeah, yeah, it's, what's the right way to say it? Those who were ready to be made ready, God is now making ready. Mm, yeah. Those who were ready to be made ready, God is now making ready. Whether they knew it or not, whether they were part of some stream, some culture that had it or not, God is divinely able to gather those who are his, and he knows how to do it. And what Dan and I have seen in the last eight days is God, through the Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by his Spirit, he is gathering his people, he's getting the message to. Let's take this phrase, we've got to stand on the Word of God. I actually do love that phrase because it affirms the value and the place of scripture. Mm -hmm. When, when that message gets preached, it's trying to include everything that the word of God has said, you know, all the books of the Bible, we got to stand on the word of God. But then the problem is they can't preach with the same authority. What the word of God actually Mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. That's good. So it's easier to preach how great the Word of God is than to preach what the Word of God is saying. (laughs) What is God saying in this hour? When you build apart from the voice of the Lord, you're building something that the Lord is not building. Hmm. And if you build apart from the Lord's will, you are building anti to him. You're building opposite him. And so all that does not originate from his voice leads away from his voice. Can we, can we hear that? So to be led to him means to follow his voice. That's where John took, uh, Dan took us in John 11. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. Dan, you had that a couple times when you were, you were saying what was happening inside of you about this is the time. And then you felt like you had to validate it with a certain person but they were so stunned. You took their stunned as something you needed to prove and validate. And suddenly they stopped you and said, no, 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 no. My spirit 
affirmed what you said. I just didn't have a response. Because mm-hmm. John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Mm-hmm. So God, we're hoping yeah. this message goes out to those who are ready to be made ready and to hear from the Spirit yourself that it's it's officially time. Are we done with the flesh? Can we say that together? Yes, Lord, I am done with the flesh. I am done with building using my own strength. I'm done with building apart from the leading and the will of the Lord. I'm done with gathering people to myself or to to something that is less than Christ. Amen. I'm done with gathering people to church and church systems and not gathering them to the Lord by the Spirit, where people themselves know that they have encountered the Lord. Yes. I'm done. To say that I'm done, what will that create? Well, Dan, you tell me, what will that create when we say, I am done playing church? Well, why are you done playing church? Why would you say that? Because of what's happening inside me. Well, you, you ate something. But for those who hear the voice, he is saying, come out of Babylon. Revelation 18. It's time to come out of Babylon. Where is Babylon, Dan? <laughs> Where is Babylon? Better question. Where is Babylon not? Okay, and let's answer that question. There is one place where Babylon is not. Mount Zion. Is that heaven? When Hebrews 12 says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the place of Enuel, it is the place in Christ that we have available to us. And when we come out of Babylon, there's a time when we have to live among Babylon. There's a time when we must live under the confines of Babylon. So that means that Babylon is quite literally everywhere that Christ is not in full control. That's your mixture. That's your blend. And so it is necessary and needful for saints and leaders alike to say, yes, Lord, I come out. I come out. You know what passage? I told you, Dan, already. The last couple of days has been God working me on coming out. I had Hebrews 13 in my heart months ago. And then I got to Isaiah 40, and it said, A voice is crying, and it says, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make Mm -hmm. straight in the desert a highway for our God. Dan, we felt like we had something of that forerunner spirit, something of that prepare people to be ready. Not because we wanted to claim it and have some title and make a a wave or something or a name for ourselves, but because it was a heavy burden on us and it was there and we had to fulfill it. Where did John the Baptist's ministry occur? In the city? Out in the wilderness. In the synagogue? Or in the wilderness? People had to leave the synagogue to come hear the forerunner call. They had to leave the city to hear the forerunner call. And out in the wilderness, they were prepared by the Lord. You know what Song of Solomon 8 says? Who is that coming up from the synagogue, leaning on her beloved? Uh, uh, I changed it. (laughs) Who is that coming up from the wilderness? leaning on her beloved. The bride is prepared in the place that's defined as unorganized, unincorporated, unsystematized, undefined. It is a place where there is life and there is person. And that's the passage God laid on me. And then, Dan, I showed you the, the, the journaling phrase that I got last year, and I read it this morning as an affirmation to this scripture today of the wilderness and the desert. And that was, you're only going to find the fellowship for the people, with the people who have come to the end times alignment. This is where we're at, Dan. This is where we're at. It's going to change the way we do our sessions now. Everyone's like, well, how do you know we're in the end times? And, well, you know, what am I going to do? And how do I get ready? And, how, you know, how do you prove the things you're talking about? And everyone's proclaimed that we're in the end times. What are you saying now? That's what the rest of everything we're going to record is going to be about. God is so funny. 
we've had these notes for weeks weeks and we tried to record and it just hasn't worked out and we started recording one time and i had to bail because the spirit wasn't moving and i was in a funk and just we recorded like halfway through and just scrapped it we're like no this is not the lord we're i'm done and then we have all this stuff happen to us and here we are recording and matt just quoted what he quoted and most of this isn't in our notes <laughs> because and we were burdened about talking about leadership and the way that John the Baptist forerunner starts his ministries in the wilderness. And what does he do when the leaders come out? He calls them like brood of vipers, like these snakes, like who warned you of the judgment to come? Why are you here? And I'm like, Oh crap, that's what we're doing right now. It's true. That's it's creepy. True. That is that's creepy. how yeah, that's interesting. That's uh, creepy. Yeah. I didn't catch that's that. kind of creepy. That was his first message on the Baptist. That was first his first message, message totally calling out the leaders and look at what God's doing in this new revamped direction of what we're doing is calling out the leaders. I got nothing else to say other than that's creepy. <laughs> Dan, can we go there for a second? Can we yeah. go there for a second? That's nuts. Can we go there for a second? If it's not the end of the age, then it's fine. You can preach. You can do whatever you want. You got your whole life left. Hmm. You can have vacation and be happy. You can save up money and buy that expensive thing. You can start that beautiful mm -hmm. car payment, you know, mm -hmm. and you can review all the times that people were wrong. Oh, 88 reasons. Well, we'll come back in 88. Harold Camp, you was wrong. You don't want to be a fool, do you? <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Unless you're going to encounter the fear of the Lord, Keep doing everything you're doing. That's not going to work for Dan and I. And we're not the only ones, are we, Dan? We're not. We are absolutely not the only ones carrying this burden. And we're not the first ones to carry this burden. And so fearing people who don't want to be foolish means that we have not come into the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord drives out the fear of man. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that destroys God's will in life, it's the fear of man. That doesn't mean that we become rambunctious or rammy. We don't cajole or force any human being because the Lord draws people out. The Lord draws people to himself. You don't have to beat anybody up. But the Lord does. And I'd say one of the main evidences and things that you want, again, is coming into the awareness of the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of man will prove to be a snare. That's Proverbs. We are at a time when soul leadership in the house of God is as intense as it ever was, but it's not at its peak yet. Do you know when it will be at its peak? Dan knows. Second Thessalonians 2, when the great apostasy occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. And the great religion is formed in the earth. And it's the height of soulish religion. That we've been trained in. That we have been fed and brought to believe has validity. And all we think are protecting us is our doctrines. <laughs> we, we think that because we have the right doctrines about the end times, that makes us ready. Interesting, because the demons have the right doctrines about the end times too, according to Peter. <laughs> Better than you. <laughs> so what makes us ready? And this was huge, Dan, when I heard this. Forget about your eschatology for one second. We're all going to get our eschatology corrected by the end. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Who is going to be the people? of the end. Not just the people alive, the people that are described, the people that is the first Peter two, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people for God's own possession. Yep. Who's going to be that? Keep your eschatology. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Are you going to become something? Are you going to become something in Christ? Or are you going to hold on to your theology that you've got it figured out and then not move into Christ? What, is, what does First Peter begin with? And coming to him as to a living 
stone. Mm -hmm. You yourselves are being built into a holy dwelling place in the Lord to offer Mm -hmm. spiritual sacrifices. It's the coming to Christ and the being built by him that makes us into what the end of that, or the second half of that chapter is concluding with saying, the holy nation, the royal priesthood, the people for God's own possession. Yep. We need the message of you need to get to Jesus. You need to get to Jesus. You need to get to Jesus. You need to beg God to get that stuff out of your soul, your flesh, your very being that is not Christ. You need to get all that out that steals from you that Holy Spirit burden of transformation to be changed into his image. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be conformed to an image of truths. God is going to display all of those truths in a life. That's what he is desiring. At the end of this age, and Dan, we know this, for all eternity. It's the display of the manifold wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. For how long? Forever. Starting when? Ephesians 3.10. Now. And God needs that body of people, that body of people who will become something, not Mm -hmm. just believe things. You don't become something through less than faith. We've talked about that. We need to have faith that God can do. We have faith that Jesus can be that in but simply believing that we've got all of the things figured out. And so now we can go watch TV all Sunday Mm because we're good is not equal to the transformation that is required to be that virgin. Who's got the lamp oil ready to go all the way to the midnight cry. Is it okay if I wrap up with two things, please? If you have anything else in your heart, you want to share. I got one more. Yeah, you do. Go ahead and show you one more thing and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude it with what I got. Soul leadership. Do it. Soul leadership. This is the time when we find out who's being led by their soul and who's being led by the spirit. This is when it happens. And unless we can recognize the leadership of the spirit, because we ourselves have come under the leadership of the spirit, mm-hmm. we will be led by human souls for mm-hmm. God which is religion. Mm -hmm. And we will be swept up in soul-based spirituality, little less, and all of its horrifying conclusions. Mm -hmm. Malachi 3, he will draw a distinction. Sorry, 4. He will draw a distinction between those and those. Everything about what God is doing is to draw a distinction. Let me pull that verse up. Three. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. 316. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Quote, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. How do you know if you're serving God? Because you're passionate about the thing that God's passionate about. Because you have a heart after the thing that God has a heart for. And what is that? the Son of God, first and foremost, collecting a people full of himself, using the means that God started this thing with. And it was the verbal word of God guiding the church throughout that first generation. And it is going to be so here in the end. And that's all we got for now, don't we, Dan? So in regard to the end times, It's better to be ready than to be right. I was reading Revelation last night, and there's so much. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the day or the hour. I don't don't know the exact, full, complete interpretation of all these things. 
studied Revelation a lot of times, but I'm reading it differently now. Uh, so it's better to be ready than to be right. There was an experiment called the Stanford Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment, to be exact. And they've made movies on it. They've had articles and documentaries written on this. Stanford Prison Experiment was where they manufactured a prison experience and they assigned people uh, to be guards and some to be prisoners. And they were just to role play, completely role play. And um, they were told that everything's being monitored and it was, and you're being observed and you're being studied. And we're just, this is a psychological human, you know, analysis kind of thing. And um, they said, if, if things get out of hand, red light's going to flash and we're going to come in and we're going to intervene, intervene. Uh, okay. And so, you know, they draw back, everyone starts playing out their roles, totally fictional. Everyone knows they're part of this experiment. They're, they were interviewed. They were part of the process. And what happens is a couple things kind of get out of hand, but then they look up at that light and it never goes off. Huh? I guess this is okay. And they keep going and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. That light still doesn't flash. People don't come in and they don't intervene. It got so out of hand, Lord of the Flies status that they had to cancel it early. God is not slow. He's patient hoping that none would perish. And there's parables. I, I gave you a worldly example of the legitimacy of the parable of the vine, right? The, the, the workers hired a bunch of people, run the vineyard, took a long time coming back, sent some people. And what are the workers that were looking after that vineyard do? Beat up all the messengers, all the prophets that came and said, hey, owner's coming back. Wants the fruit of the labor? And they said, no. Then he sent his only son and they killed him. The Lord is coming back. What we're doing in this vineyard now, what you're doing with your talents now, are you assuming he's never going to come? Do you think that everyone's exempt just because generations have gone by and people have had it wrong? Is that really the posture of heart that you want to have? Would you rather be cut off guard like the five virgins that did not carry enough oil to endure the dark night? Or would you rather be ready? I don't know all the answers. We don't know all the answers of revelation of the end times and the exact cadence of events. But one thing we do know is Amos 3.7. God does nothing except what he reveals to the prophets. And one thing Matt and I have done is we've tested prophets. We've tested apostles through a lot of what we've just shared with you. Who's got the message of Christ? Who has the brand marks of the cross? Who's been tested and tried and come out true? Then we say, what are the prophets saying? <laughs> and what is my spirit saying? What do the scriptures say? And that's why we're here telling you he's coming. And if you want to be ready, it's what we're here for. And we're not alone. So we'll see you soon.